Um, right, Although, I'm, uh, I'm getting on set here. Okay. Uh, We're rolling? Okay. Uh, it's um, October 3rd, 2010. We're talking to Greg Christopoulos. Greg, when and why did you start climbing? Well, I uh, was in graduate school at an American university at the, uh, after I got out of the Army in the 70s, mm -hmm. early 70s, and I took some uh, coursework in uh, Geneva, and it just seemed like a better way to learn French than sitting around a classroom, so I went over to Chamonix and uh, took uh, an Alpine course and uh, guided trips with the French Alpine Club, mm -hmm. and uh, they went over basic uh, crampon technique, how to maneuver on a glacier. It was in August, so we didn't have to worry about falling in a crevasse. Everything was exposed, mm -hmm. but you still had to be able to walk competently. Uh, the crampons were all uh, ten pointers back then, and mm -hmm. uh, we used uh, appropriately, as you'd expect, French technique. Right, which and, involves... Uh, uh, the flat of the foot. Rather right, than and you're walking up a hill backwards. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very, very tiring. Only the French would think of walking up a hill backwards. Yeah, I, th I think the Austrians were uh, at that time developing uh, a more efficient technique, but it, for, for the summer uh, trade, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, they were still teaching the flat-footed technique, and that was what was available for renting. And it's more secure. Uh, just, just one minute. Sure. Uh, try and look at John when you're doing that okay. you're not the camera. Okay. So All right. He's, yeah. your, he's your eye line. Right. Got it. It's, uh, it's more secure and less tiring than front pointing. Not from my experience. Uh, I always found the front pointing much less uh, work. If I, uh, as long as I, my calf was flexed enough mm -hmm. and I uh, kept my heel in the right position, my, my quads would just die on those... Uh, guided French uh, trips, and mm -hmm. I was in pretty good shape back then, but uh, it, it, I found it hard. And the, uh, the belay technique was the same as the club used, uh, body belays. There were no uh, mechanical devices at all at, at that time that, mm -hmm. that I saw. I mean, maybe some of the shops had it, but it wasn't uh, standard yet. Do you use a harness or tie in to the rope? Uh, I think... Uh, we did swami belts mm -hmm. and bolins on a coil, uh, all obscure things which uh, people would look at you askance around here if you did that now, and that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came back uh, to the States, I uh, started going on trips with the, uh, the club. Uh, and. Uh, Dave Templeman at the time was uh, running uh, the training program for the club. So I went on three or four uh, trips. One of them was a trip to uh, Seneca. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would take you out one day and we'd be on the uh, southern pillar. Oh. Uh, we'd climb it, uh, belay, they'd give us a belay from the top and we'd come down. And then the next day they'd pair you up uh, with an experienced leader, so uh, I went with two leaders and a, another climber. We were the middlemen. We uh, did Eeyore's Tail, which was my mm -hmm. first multi-pitch climb, and they did use hexes on that that climb. And I uh, looked at them and said, "This is weird stuff because the uh, purlon cord looks so thin." But anyway, and that would have been nine mil or on um, some of them eight. Yeah, mil. but this was the, he. he the guy who was leading planted some really small stuff. Ah. It was the, the, the smaller, I don't know if it was a chenard. Yeah. It, it may not have been because I don't know when chenard came up with the uh, kind of offset design for the hex to give more flexibility to its That was placement. the second generation of hex. Um, yeah. Probably, you know, 70, 72, thereabouts. Now, when we're practicing on the southern pillar, this sounds really weird, but uh, Dave Templeman, the, the trainer, he had kind of a leather corset, mm -hmm. and he would get into a body belay position, and he'd lower you down with the uh, rope around his back, and his the leather corset around his back would give the uh, the friction, and he could control the rope that way. It was mm -hmm. a 
it was a free-hanging body belay. Uh -huh. As I said, there were no uh, devices around then, and he had, didn't have anything placed. But, you know, subsequently I've been uh, out west on uh, canyoneering trips, and uh -huh. I've taken uh, short rope lessons uh, out at uh, Seneca. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, those techniques still have a place, uh, yeah. but not in a, by today's standards, not in a dead vertical situation. Let me let me get back to uh, the multi pitch. Mm -hmm. After we finished uh, Eeyore's tail, we were in the notch, mm -hmm. and we wrapped off out of the uh, gun sight notch. And I've been back to that location. It's really amazing because there is a, a crooked pine tree there. Yes, it has a ninety degree bend in it. Mm -hmm. And we wrapped off that pine tree with a body belay. Ooh. Which is really <laughs> that would uh, the, I mean, as I think about it now. I mean, I've used body belay since, but on low angle stuff, oh, yeah. you know, it's very easy to fall out of it. But it was, it wasn't that the club was doing anything reckless. It was just the way things were done then. Yeah, the guidebook used to describe that rappel as start with an awkward swing into space. That is that is very true, and it's. I don't think we even had uh, a belay on while they were lowering us, the experienced guys. We just wow. went out and did it. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it is a really hard initiation. Uh, yep. uh, fortunately, there's been a lot of advances in technology mm -hmm. and technique since then. Mm -hmm. uh, other uh, trips with the club, uh, one was particularly memorable. We, uh, we went out to uh, Cupid's Bower and we did the uh, Oscar uh, drop the uh, weight and catch it. And that was one of the really outstanding things of the club training back then. You'd, you'd catch a, uh, we, we cut a chunk of log mm -hmm. off of a dead tree, hoisted it up. The log would get dropped. You'd be tied to the ground and you'd have to do a dynamic belay on it and mm -hmm. slow it down with your hands and your uh, gloves. Mm -hmm. And the rope is going around your back. And we all did that several times. And... I guess we really developed a strong muscle memory mm -hmm. to belay because, you, as I said, you didn't have any mechanical assistance other than your, the rope going around your, your body and maybe you'd have a beaner clip to keep the rope from keep sliding from, under you right. or going up on, under your shoulder and burning. Right. And uh, the beaner was it. That was your mechanical device. Right. Uh, How much rope did you let out usually to to catch that fall, yeah, maybe 15 feet. It was wow. uh, it was a good good catch. Now, I mean, the club was famous for this training technique. It was mm -hmm. uh, well known in uh, Europe because when I read uh, Gaston or uh, how do you pronounce it, Ray Buffa, Ray Buffa's book on alpine climbing, he has a discussion about the club's training techniques and how good he thinks it is. And, and his book at that time did not talk about using mechanical devices. He mm -hmm. was, uh, I think the book was written in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in some ways, our, the club techniques were well advanced over what other people were doing at the time. Mm. Uh, uh, now this was all developed by Arnold Wexler? Uh, I, I assume so. I, right. I would meet Arnold occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't ever get to climb with him. I guess the old timers I climbed with was more John Christian later, mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was really a good conditioning exercise because when you're driving, you don't think where the brake pedal is, you know. Right. And you know where the accelerator is. And uh, when you're riding your bike, you know where your uh, brake handles are. And it, it, mm -hmm. belaying got like that with us. It right. was just very quick, instantaneous muscle memory. I'm not going to think about it. Right. And, just, uh, Just to put it in historical pr perspective, um, calling a, a mantle move a Gaston refers to Gaston Rebuffa. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, one of the first, you know, uh, acrobatic climbers uh, in the French Alps. But, that, you know, that's the only connect the, the connection today to, to Gaston is, is that. Well, he, uh, before he passed on, he was in the D.C. area and he did a slideshow. Mm -hmm. I uh, was fortunate to be there, and uh, he uh, had a uh, review of 
all of his famous climbs at that show. I mm -hmm. think it was sp sponsored by the American Alpine Club and uh, PATC at the time. Right. But uh, anyway, I was struck really that he, here he was, one of the top climbers in the world, and he's talking about what this little club in D.C. does, mm -hmm. and he's advocating it as a model mm -hmm. for professional guides and climbers all over Europe where mm -hmm. the sport originated. Right. Uh, now, um, Dave would also uh, take us out on uh, lead uh, practice climbs, and uh, mm -hmm. this is where uh, we had a, a uh, well, I guess the club's first fatality. I uh, think so, yes. Yes. That was uh, at Wolf Rock? Uh, or Big Schloss, as it's B called. Big Schloss, yeah. Uh, we went out, there were about four or five of us, it was, it was a good turnout. There were some experienced people going, and newbies like myself, mm -hmm. and uh, Dave did a, the lead up Big Schloss with uh, two newbies. Mm -hmm. I was the last man, and uh, Dave, of course, did, did the leading. Mm -hmm. There was a traverse section, so the middle man was uh, secured at both ends. Right, that which was is Marty... The, Marty X, he never ah. gave us his name. Ah. Uh, Did you ever see him again? No, he right. just dropped out of sight after, after that. Uh, so Dave did the uh, climb, went up the top, set up an anchor. I belayed Marty from the back end and Dave had him from the front end and mm -hmm. everything was fine. And then it was my turn and I was uh, scared to do the traverse, even though it was maybe 15, 20 feet off the ground, that's all. Mm -hmm. I was only belayed from the front end, which mm -hmm. means it's the same as leading, effectively. And all the intermediate protection is gone, correct? Uh, he had cleaned a lot of it. I think he cleaned everything, except, that's a good question. Maybe, he may have left some stuff on the horizontal section. I okay. hope he did. I, I was, that's just what you should do. Mm -hmm. You got to think of. Uh, protecting a traverse is always harder because you got to think about yourself while you're leading and you got to think about the guy coming behind you. Uh, so Dave did the uh, classic maneuver that a guide would do. He took the extra rope and dropped it down. Mm -hmm. So I was then belayed with a top rope and uh, the rope that uh, Marty had, had used. In effect, I had a double belay, but while I was doing the traverse, I'd be protected from above. Okay. The rope. But you were also belayed from below? No. I, oh, okay. There was no one. I was the last man you of the, the party one. of three. Okay. So uh, I said, I can't do this. I'm not comfortable. He says, don't worry. Dave was very reassuring. He mm -hmm. said, uh, I'll put you on tension. Mm -hmm. uh, I can help you do the move. I'll, I'll have you up here. And uh, so I uh, was traversing. And uh, I slipped. Now the face was overhung, so when I uh, slipped, it wasn't that I fell straight down. Right. I swung away from swung the cliff from and the came cliff. down. Right. So it was. At the end of it, it was more than a 15-foot fall or a 15-foot drop because there's the swing out and there was a grassy slope underneath me. Ah. So I don't know what it was, but I know I came down really fast. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, what happened? And, right. and suddenly Dave had come off the edge and he was lying on the ground next to me. Right. And uh, I, w I was in shock. Uh, right. This guy, Marty, came down and tried to give him CPR, but it was right. uh, hopeless. I mean, uh, you, do, you had the impression that you weren't falling completely. Uh, he was, I. You, you I, think he was, he was holding you? He was holding me. You know, that muscle memory is mm -hmm. in there mm -hmm. that the club had drilled into us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds very military, but in effect, that's what we were doing. Sure. And uh, the code, you know, mm -hmm. you don't let your partner down, and mm -hmm. he wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so he, he held on, and uh, I think the, the accident report pointedly says he slipped quietly over the side, and that's... Uh, right. Right. That's true. Um, so you, you then, when you looked up, he was he was alongside you. He was alongside me, and uh, I still get a 
shocked sometimes when I hear the whoosh of a sure. rope falling. And I say, wow, that sure. sounds too close. Sure. But uh, at that time, one of the more experienced members in the club was uh, Chuck Sproul. Chuck Sproul, right. And uh, he had a little notebook in his shirt pocket. Don't mm -hmm. ask me why. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of guy he was. And he uh, kept it together and he interviewed everyone. It was very systematic. You know, he interviewed everyone separately. It was uh, very professional what mm -hmm. he did. And uh, he wound up putting a first class accident report together, which was published in uh, Uprope and then in Climbing mm -hmm. Accidents of North America. And, right. And his analysis was that basically Dave had shifted position and lifted his own pro out when he was mm -hmm. putting me at on tension mm -hmm. and there was a possibility to building a more omnidirectional or an omnidirectional belay stance which Dave didn't uh, let me say uh, it was common back then to belay off of one piece people would belay off of one pin mm -hmm. now you and I when we're climbing now we could see a bomber pin and we'll still back it up mm -hmm. exactly and uh, that's why I love my little uh, tricams. They're great for that. Right. And uh, it, it was just, he wasn't being sloppy or careless. He was just a product of his time his and time. the practices that we uh, followed. Back then, there were no cordelettes. Right. There was none of this ritual uh, of trying to build a uh, equalized anchor system. Mm -hmm. uh, my... Uh, partner Dave Coffey and I have a little mantra we do when we're placing uh, pro mm -hmm. with uh, cams, spring-loaded cams or stoppers or tri-cams. We have this little drill we go through when we're building the bullet stance. Mm -hmm. uh, one for you, one for me, and one for the two of us. So we try and have three solid pieces at every bullet stance. It's not in any book, that's our thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does kind of reinforce that you really can't be dependent on, on one piece. Although subsequently uh, I was leading a climb in the gunks once and I did belay off of one hex mm -hmm. and bring a guy up, but I said, wow, this is weird. What am I doing? But I, I checked it again and I had threaded it from the back of a crack uh -huh. behind a huge pillar mm -hmm. and it was an oversized hex. It just was not going anywhere mm -hmm. and it, it worked. But, uh, I was just kind of surprised I was doing it, but the, the circumstances uh, justified it, and it wasn't any use wasting time. <coughs> Do you think Dave's hex lifted out from the top? I don't know. I, I've never been to the and seen how he did it and matched it up with Chuck's uh, mm -hmm. uh, description. I mean, you don't see those kinds of accidents anymore, or you shouldn't, mm -hmm. because... Guys like Chuck wrote up a very good accident report and it finally sunk into the community that you really need multiple placements mm -hmm. at a stance. Although sometimes when I go out to uh, uh, Little Stony Man, mm -hmm. I said, boy, these people are pushing, the, uh, pushing their luck, you know, they're just not careful enough. Uh, uh, leading there, you mean? Yeah, because... The Park Service wants to discourage people from putting anchor ropes all the way across the AT, which uh -huh. is now on the top yes. of the uh, rock. Yes. So some of the placements do make me a little uh, nervous. And uh, I, I know what you mean. You know, they, they, they think each piece is a bomber, and it mm -hmm. may be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, a Canadian-Dutch uh, climbing partner of mine used to have a little expression he'd use when we were in the Canadian Alps or in Europe. Mm -hmm. He says, hurry slowly, you'll get there faster. And uh, some of these people, when they're placing anchors, they should hurry slowly mm -hmm. and make sure they've got three solid pieces. I, I don't go for this thing where you, you rate each piece and come up with a, uh, a score overall. That sounds like uh, a recipe for disaster. Uh, I mean, you should try and have every peach, piece be really solid and uh, such that, uh, although there are places where you have to do that, Canadian Rockies has a lot of very unstable yeah, rocks. Loose so, rock. Right. So you need to 
put in a lot of marginal pieces and hopefully come up with hopefully. one yeah. no, but solid I, one. I know what you mean about Little Stony Man. I ran a course there for the Army and was shocked to find a guy that had put multiple climbs hanging off one TCU. <laughs> Uh, people know what a TCU is? Uh, a tri a spring-loaded uh, tiny three-cam unit. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. And uh, not what you should do and not what you hope a, uh, uh -huh. uh, an AMGA guide is going to do. Uh, well, I, I think the AMGA and their has really pushed the standards of safety up because people are talking to each other more right. and they're getting uh, ideas. Uh, there's been a huge change in climbing practice. You know? mm -hmm. uh, there's the uh, the harness, right. the helmet, right. and mechanical belay devices of various kinds make a huge difference in uh, safety and giving you control over uh, a fall. People didn't understand in 1972 that the shocks were directional, uh, much more so than pitons. Uh, that that's a fair ass assessment, although as I, uh, the example I gave, sometimes you could place them just right, and they oh, would be yes, a bomber. Yes, no question. And Dave, that's what Dave thought he had, probably. Yeah, he, he was a product of his time. He was, right. but he was very, uh, you know, he was at the top of his game mm -hmm. mechanically based on what people were doing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he represented the best ideals of of a climbing and the camaraderie. You don't mm -hmm. let your partner down, exactly. And you uh, you take responsibility for someone else when you've got them on belay. Right. Uh, the the irony is, uh, it would have been better if he dropped it. I mean, he didn't know that he didn't because know that. right, I would have probably survived the fall, and Dave would have. You know, as as it was, we both almost got killed right. because if he right. hit me. Yeah, you would have been dead. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Well, I used to have this naive idea of, well, I could break his fall if he'd hit me, but that's, that's, that's crazy. No, that's we true. would have had two casualties. And I'm still shocked when I hear about people taking 70-foot falls and, you know. Surviving. Surviving, yeah. Now, he had taken his helmet off. He did he not have a helmet on, but I don't think that would have made no, any difference made because, any difference. you know, the helmet works up to a point. Yeah. But uh, there's also the neck. Mm-hmm. And and the back and it mm -hmm. was just really yeah. now one one thing that is surprising is that Dave was used to having the stance be a big part of the belay, right? So not only did the nut fail, but the stance failed. Yeah, and that's understandable. If you're giving someone tension, you're kind of already towards the end over the, over the edge mm -hmm. to try and keep the rope tight mm -hmm. and keep them on belay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in effect, he's trying to lift you over the move or protect right. you. So, uh, he, he was a, a solid guy. I didn't right. know him well personally. I just knew him from those three or four trips. Right. And, right. Uh, he was 46 then? I Something like yeah, that, yeah. yeah. How old were you? Uh, I was in my, uh, I'd have to do the arithmetic, but I was. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I was in the <laughs> uh, mid 20s. Mid 20s, yeah. Or late 20s. And you didn't stop climbing. Uh, there were a lot of guys in the club uh, who encouraged me. Mm -hmm. uh, and at one level, I felt guilty. And at the other level, I was angry that he didn't do it right. Right. Uh, it's kind of conflicting emotions. Sure. And uh, you know, people call me up and say, let's go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed the camaraderie and the physical challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was always getting, I'm, I'm not a natural athlete, and I enjoy the, actually, perversely, I enjoy the problem solving of trying to become a better climber. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would uh, get my butt out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I then also took... Uh, Bob Norris's course. Oh yes, Bob Norris. Just to make sure I understood everything, and Norris was teaching what the standards were back then. I think we were still doing body belays. It was mm -hmm. that same year or mm -hmm. the year after. Yep. And uh, 
He taught yeah. at Carter Rock in Great Falls mostly? Yeah, uh, this class was at Carter Rock and we mm -hmm. do a practice lead up the laundry chute then do a traverse and then go up. So, mm -hmm. And we have placements to clean. Um, no, he, he was teaching what was available then, and you know, in, in advance of this, uh, I've gone over some of the, the books from then. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have the MIT uh, Climbing Guide and also the two books by Royal Robbins. And you can look at those books and you can see things that are wrong. You know, they're cross-loading uh, beaners. Yes. Uh, they're, uh, I mean, it's, it's just... This is a uh, engineering process, and we learn from our mistakes and somewhat mm -hmm. in, in climbing. And we, we have learned, and like I said, uh, you shouldn't see those same kind of mistakes again, although I think some people are very uh, lackadaisical when they uh, put a spring-loaded cam. Very much. They assume it's, uh, it's a bomber. And, what uh, was the MIT guide? That's, uh, that's a little yellow uh, booklet I had with some mm -hmm. uh, off-color... Uh, hand-drawn sketches. Mm -hmm. I can uh, loan it to you if you want to take a look at it. Uh, sure. That's one I've not heard of before. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look at books, I mean, the idea of having a harness was mm -hmm. uh, somewhat controversial. Mm -hmm. A helmet was somewhat controversial. Robbins was not impressed by helmets. No. And uh, now that's uh, SOP. Mm -hmm. uh, no one would think of, uh, or shouldn't think of. Even top roping the, the classes anyway are all have helmets. Helmeted, and, yeah. 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 Don't see them in the gym, but that's you know. yeah. And of course, helmets are better now than they were back then. Right. I mean, my first helmet was basically a caver's or a construction helmet. Ah. Uh, and my first harness was a swami belt mm -hmm. of one inch tubular webbing, but you would put a leg loops in right. in it, so you could you made it into a sit harness. You couldn't hang in it very long, but it no. was better than just a plain swami. But right. uh, Henry Barber did all his top climbs with uh, <laughs> with just a swami belt, mm -hmm. a very thick swami belt. Mm -hmm. It was very yeah. common. Two two inch. Uh, wow, two inch webbing. I think the book that really moved climbing practices along was uh, the Chenard catalog that came out with his new pro and the article in there on placing pro. Um, one I know was written by Doug Robinson. That's the article. Yep. And uh, uh, it was then reprinted by uh, John Standard with some other tips and tricks that right. he... He used to publish a newsletter called The Eastern Trade. The Eastern Trade. I have one copy of that left when, yeah. when he reprinted Doug Robinson's article. Right. Right. I remember and, reading uh, that. And in the Chenard catalog, I mean, they talked about having <coughs> single-length runners, two doubles, and a triple. Mm -hmm. Triples got in the way, and I stopped using it, but the triple was a... Uh, forecast, if you will, of the cordelet right. in, in a way, although we didn't use it that way. We, we didn't have the idea yet of creating a, a master point with one piece connecting all the pieces together. It was uh, time consuming, at least for me. I wasn't quick to build a uh, multi-stage anchor, mm -hmm. a multi-point anchor, and it got much better with the cordelet. Of course, now I gone back and I use my climbing rope right, right. <laughs> to do it. But uh, Why use a small rope when you've got a big one? Bigger one. Right. Although, again, the guides influenced us for, for good reason <laughs> because they figure they're going to have to lead everything so it's easier just to have a cordelette there and they can keep mm -hmm. going without having to shift. I mean, using your rope works very well if you... Uh, are going to swap leads. I know, yeah, <laughs> if you have a nice stance where you can sw yeah. swap out the ends of the rope. Yeah. Right. Where else did you climb? Well, mostly uh, around here. I've been out to the Tetons mm -hmm. once or once, I guess. 
I'm mostly a East Coast uh, gunks, mm -hmm. Seneca climber, and uh, I would go up to uh, the gunks <coughs> every other weekend. That's back when the traffic wasn't so bad. And you could leave on a Friday and uh, get back on a Sunday night and right. uh, get yeah. up there and still get enough sleep. Right. Nowadays, uh, I'd want to leave... Uh, <laughs> Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Right. And uh, you, you can't get out of downtown D.C. to do that <laughs> run. And you can't make it out of Tyson's Corner after work because the traffic on the bridge kills you. Right. Right. But yeah. uh, it was... Uh, Even though it was slower traffic, you, you, there was just lots less of it. Yeah. Well, I had a heavy foot. Um, well, and lots of DC climbers went to the gunks quite often. Yeah, I mean, we'd uh, stop at a uh, a Roy Rogers in Harrisburg, and they had an all-you-could-eat chicken, and we'd pig out there. And sometimes you'd meet other climbers who were heading up there. You can always count on seeing John Standard mm -hmm. somewhere on the road or up there in his Vega. And the only thing uh, John Standard and I had in common is we both drove a Vega to the Gunks. But otherwise, right. we're on two different universes. Right. Yeah, he estimated he'd been there a thousand days. I, I could believe that. I mean, he, 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 in a, he almost, in a way, invented a hybrid sport because mm -hmm. he put in stand what the people referred to back then as the standard piton, uh, which was a very inch, solid. Yeah, yeah. three-quarter so, inch angle. Right, and that would stay in the rock. Mm -hmm. And it'd be a permanent fixture, so people wouldn't be putting pitons in and out. He actually made those himself, right? I I, I don't know about that. But I think they were so. solid, and you still come across them at the gunks. Yeah. And the purpose was to preserve rocks. So in a way, you were doing something that was similar to a, a sport climb. Right. You knew there was a good piece there. Right. Although that doesn't mean all the climbs were well protected, as I found right. out. Right. Following years, I, when I was leading five six and five seven, I went back and did a five four with uh, my long-term partner Dave Coffey, mm -hmm. and he looked at me and he said, "No wonder it took you so long to get to five six or five seven. You scare the shit out of yourself. There's no protection on that five four. Why did you even bother to do it? <laughs> you now they didn't rate the uh, protection on the climbs back then, and right. I had this nutty theory." I'm going to do all the fours, and then I'm going to do all the fives. Mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. That was a dumb idea. <laughs> you can scare really, you. <laughs> it scared me for no reason. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just some climbs should be skipped. <laughs> right. Or nowadays it'd be easier because you have things that would work in the horizontal cracks right. better. Right, right. Tricams are... Are, uh, are uh, the perfect gunks right. piece. Or uh, uh, cam units. Yeah. yeah, but even the cam units, when you had the rigid friend, they were the first cams, mm -hmm. they wouldn't work very well in the horizontal cracks because mm -hmm. you were afraid it, it'd lever. It was a solid bar. It wouldn't right. bend. Right. So you'd go to the uh, rock and snow, and they'd sell you a cord, mm -hmm. a piece of uh, pearl on the biggest one that you could fit in there, and you'd put a backup. Into the lightning holes in the shaft. Right. That was... Right. That was how we uh, handled the horizontal crack problem. Or the other trick was uh, you'd put two uh, stoppers in opposition on one piece of sling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never had to test one of those, but uh, that was the best game in town for dealing with the uh, horizontal crack. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you could find a place where a, a hex would work, where there was a constriction in a horizontal crack, but... They, by and large, they're parallel. Right. And uh, th that's why the, uh, the tri-cam or the cabled uh, spring-loaded cam works so much better. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, developed some of the ice climbing uh, in this area, right? Inadvertently. Uh, Dave and I were having one of our uh, annual adventures on uh, Shockley Ceiling. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we're the ones who gets rescued, and other times we help another party. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this was a time we were helping another party whose two followers couldn't pull the ceiling. So Dave went up, uh, followed the climb, cleaned it. Then I followed him, and we dropped the line down. Shockley's without. 
and brought the other two people up. Mm -hmm. So th that was the uh, occasion when we were the uh, rescuers for the besieged on uh, Shockley's ceiling. Mm -hmm. But while Dave was up there, he was uh, talking to a guy and he was talking about ice climbing. And, he says, and the guy was from the Philadelphia area and he said, uh, oh, you, you go to Regalsville? And we said, Regalsville? What's that? So uh, it sounded interesting. So before Thanksgiving, to make sure we didn't get lost when winter really came, mm -hmm. we drove up there to make sure we knew the route and where things were. And this was pre-Thanksgiving. And there was ice f already forming on these ravines. I think it's now called the Delaware Narrows mm -hmm. or Kintersville. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, you've got kind of a mini climb there because the Delaware River is a north-south flowing system, but it makes uh, a turn, two turns there, a zigzag, and it's flowing um, east to west at that point. Mm -hmm. So the ravines in Pennsylvania are facing due north. So it's like you're 500 miles further north. The sun never shines there. There's a, kind of a boggy area up on top where they cleared off the trees so that the power lines go by. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good drainage. And over the years, it's grosses people out, but the drainage has improved because there's now houses up there and their septic tanks flow into the cliff. So you have a more constant water supply freezing up. <laughs> hey, I climb the stuff. I don't drink it, you right, know? Right. That's what I tell them. But it's uh, much better now. And uh, we didn't tell anyone about it because the locals said, hey, you know, it's our thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So. We honored their request, but then a Pennsylvania guide came out and it listed it. So we started telling other D.C. locals about it. And I, I remember uh, Stuart Pregnell asked me to do a slideshow about my uh, trip around the world where I uh, cut life and went traveling for six months. And I said, mm -hmm. I'll do that and I'll show you some pictures of local ice. And there was a uh, kind of a yawn in the audience, local ice. What could that be? Mm -hmm. And then we got to pictures of Regalville, and well, that's what we we called it. Mm -hmm. we, people were just shocked how big it was, and uh, how impressive it was, and how accessible it was. I mean, it ran six to eight uh, weekends easy a year most most years. Right. Last year was a really good year for. I can it. imagine yep. if you could drive up there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, that was the problem. But uh, it, it's an amazing uh, location. I uh, went up there once uh, with Dave and Jeanette, and uh, the Delaware had frozen and then mm -hmm. melted. And it was, there were these huge ice flows, and you couldn't get to the climb because the river had flooded and the access road that runs parallel ah, right. was, was closed off and the firemen wouldn't let us go. And uh, those huge ice flows sitting in the, uh, mm -hmm. the river moving down, they looked just like the uh, picture of Washington crossing the Delaware. It was, wow. it was just that same scene except, mm -hmm. well, that was a stage photograph anyway. No general would stand up in a, in a right. boat crossing an ice flow river. But... Anyway, the, the river, the, the uh, artist really did, did capture how the river looks mm -hmm. when the ice upriver has broken up and these huge chunks the size of a car are, are floating down. Right, so, you know, global warming, despite global warming, it did happen, at least yeah. in times past, yeah. Right. Um, what, when did you do your trip around the world? Uh, late 70s, uh, I uh, met my Canadian climbing partner in uh, Europe. We did the, I think it's the Grossglockner in Austria, and we did uh, Mont Blanc mm -hmm. and some other things. And then he took off and got a real job. And then Dave Coffey came over, and uh, it was fall climbing. We did some stuff in the uh, uh, Dolomites. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think they really do French free because there were some things I, I couldn't do the move and we concluded, yeah, they must pull on the piece. Pull on the piece, right. And after that, I uh, went sightseeing. I spent time in Turkey where uh, 
I'm sure my grandmother was uh, from, although she was a Greek national from mm -hmm. there. And then on to India. I did uh, the railroad travel around India for a month. Mm -hmm. Then I went uh, to Nepal trekking and climbing. And uh, it was a guided trip with uh, what was then uh, mountain travel. Mm -hmm. And the guide was Skip Horner, I think, who went on to uh, guide the Seven Summits. Yeah. After that, I uh, went to Southeast Asia, went from uh, Thailand down to Malaysia, uh, spent uh, some time in uh, Sri Lanka, the Seychelles, which, by the way, uh, has excellent climbing potential. Although I didn't get to do it. In the Seychelles? Seychelles, really huge rock faces. And then I was uh, ended up in Africa for about a month and I hired a guide from a group called Tropical Ice. Mm -hmm. And uh, had a Brit running it and an American, Vince Basad, and uh, he took me up Mount Kenya. That's probably the hardest, most sustained alpine climb I, I've done. It, it's five four, five five moves. Mm -hmm. You're doing it with an overnight pack in mountaineering boots. And the route is convoluted. I've, I've met other guys who were climbers who are much stronger than me, but they had trouble with the route finding. So having a guide, definitely. Was this the diamond or just the, uh, the diamond couloir or another route? This was a rock rock, rock route. Okay. Rock route. It wasn't an ice, ice climb. And uh, we spent the night at the top. There's this little hut that Ian Howell had man portaged up there mm -hmm. in prefabricated aluminum sections with uh he owned tropical ice no he was just a uh the hard man climber in the area right right and it was a with the hut was like a lean-to shape aluminum structure three feet high maybe four feet you'd crawl into it and spend the night there and then uh, you start your uh, wraps down and it was uh, the most repelling I'd ever done in my life. Now, uh, one of the uh, ropes we had was worn through the core while we were wrapping down. Wow. But it still worked as a wrap line. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was, uh, I guess, expensive to get gear to Africa. Sure. And the hardest part physically was the down climb that was hiking out because there's something on. Kenya, people sarcastically refer to it sometimes as the great vertical bog. Right. On most mountains, you have a stream and the water flows out. This place has a huge marshy area. Mm -hmm. They have marked poles with uh, bullseyes on them to show you the way down so you don't get lost in this bog. But the problem with walking out in a bog is you just can't put your foot down because you'll sink. So you're always lowering yourself on your uphill foot as you're hiking out. Mm -hmm. It is a long day. It's a, it's a hard part. Um, and you're wet all the time, right? And your, your boots are getting wet, yeah. Now the local porter, he wears these big rubber clodhoppers. Mm -hmm. He's a smart guy. But mm -hmm. uh, you and the guide are in leather boots, and uh, you're just getting stuck all the time. It's... Uh, I've talked to other people who've trekked Mount Kenya, and they remember the uh, vertical bog, or whatever they call it, as uh, not so fond memories. It's mm -hmm. just an exhausting part of the, uh, the climb. Mm -hmm. How long were you gone, all told? Uh, about six months. Uh -huh. I used to tell people I learned uh, three things on this trip. The U.S. is the land of the free, the home of the brave. It has plumbing, and the plumbing works. And th th those last two may be the most important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially all the, all the places you've been. Um, you're still climbing, right? Yeah, I uh, I've got I'm going back and trying to do climbs that I first started to learn on and and lead. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave and I have our uh, quote bucket list mm -hmm. that we're working on. And uh, I know I'm much older, 30, 40 years older than I started. But mm -hmm. according to those books, I'm a better uh, climber back then and now than I was because every time they revise a Seneca or a Gunk's Guidebook, they always move the ratings up. 
Right. I never see them moving them down. Right. <coughs> So you get to be a better climber every time a guidebook comes out. Absolutely. It's kind of an amazing process. I go. mean, this year I didn't get to do any leading or I haven't yet, but uh, I was, mm -hmm. last year I was doing 5-6. Uh, and I have some uh, other guys there, uh, Marty, who uh, coaches me along. And mm -hmm. He's patient with uh, the old guy. Mm -hmm. You used to climb with your daughter, right? Yes, uh, she's now into bicycling, right? That's right. I used to see you out at uh, Great Falls. Yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, getting her into climbing was a kick because she got into it as a little kid right. before they started bringing gear from Europe. Right. So I had to make a harness for her uh, out of one-inch webbing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I had a helmet for her. Well, it was top roping, so I didn't particularly worry about that, but I'd right. have her wear a bicycle helmet. Right. And then her first climbing shoes, I, I made them myself. I, uh, she bought some red, white, and blue Chuck Connor basketball mm -hmm. canvas sneakers, and I bought a 510 rubber kit, resole kit. I glued it on and took the sander and did the, uh, right. the edging, and those were her first climbing shoes. And uh, actually, we passed them on to another kid at... Uh, the Rockville gym. Wow. I uh, I felt like I was going back to the business because my father at uh, one time had been a cobbler and my grandfather had been a cobbler. So oh, wow. I, could, I could still do the basics, you know, put the sole on, glue it, uh, buff the edge down. Mm -hmm. Wow. But she's and not she, she's not climbing anymore? She's doing triathlete stuff. Mm -hmm. She's done competitive bike bicycle riding. She was at the Nationals for the uh, half Ironman in, uh, in Florida the year before last. Wow. Where does she live now? She's uh, at home right now. Ah. I, I, I think, you know, I could take her out and she could easily follow. Uh, she started when she was young, so she's Very got young. the balance. Right. Five, 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 six following oh, sure. would not be a problem. I'd sure. Probably get her to. She used to be my rope gun. Right. I remember. I remember. You and uh, Carter Rock Jeff, who I still haven't seen around. I mean, you were, you were always right. very helpful. Right. Shooing other climbers away so you'd find an easy route for her to work on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's still around. Uh, not many other people from that era, though. Uh, Seems like they they tend to fade out after a certain point. Yeah, I, I uh, tell people I've been a beginning climber and a beginning skier for uh, thirty plus years, and I'm still working at it. Well, yeah, being a beginning skier uh, in the South is uh, is not a surprise. You get to relearn every year, it seems. Um, what else can we say? I guess I've gone on long enough. I don't know if this is a caveat you don't want to get into, but um, sure. I'm just curious as far as development goes in the Seneca and the Gunks. I've, I've gone up to both areas a couple times, and I've always found that the Gunks are significantly easier than grading. There's different people that were setting it up. Does, do you find that as well? Like Seneca is very well known for being a difficult area. I, I think the reason the guidebooks kept keep getting revised upward is that the people who climbed at the Gunks in Seneca were not part of the Yosemite decimal system and they were just kind of pulling the numbers out of the air. As people travel more, the standards have been uh, homogenized. homogenized is the word of it. Right. right. And I think Seneca does trip people up because it's got a lot of air. Very you steep. can be I mean, you, you look at old, la old ladies, it's a 5-3. It's a convoluted route. If you were exploring the place for the first time, you wouldn't see that as an obvious line that you go up this easy thing, go through a notch, and then go back down the other side one step and then back up. When you look at that move, it, it does have, for a 5-2, it's got a lot of air. And that, that's, that's very typical. And... Uh, that little move is protected by a huge mass of piton scars. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why people put piton scars there. It's, it's a, but that's just a 5-2. And then there's a, 
lower skyline direct. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is that's only a five three. Right. And if they wanted to call it a four, I guess they could, but that would ruin the character of the climb. It's got a very airy, airy move, and you're traversing out over he gods and uh, little fishes, which is a five eight. Right. Bombay uh, drop below you. So it, it, right. I think it throws people in the air. It's not easy to protect either. Yeah, I mean, that is a climb where you are dependent, actually that one in particular, on a resident piton. Mm -hmm. One of the few remaining. Yeah. I guess uh, I just don't hang around there long enough to uh, want to put a piece in. I just, right. I've got it wired now, although I have been known to back off it when I first started. I'm not the first one. Nope. Nope. So I think the, the amount of air kind of throws people. You you go up to the coxcomb. That's a very thin piece of rock for the East Coast. I, my friend Dave has brought some, a guy down who was a 5'8 climber at uh, the Gunks. And mm -hmm. uh, he was surprised and taken aback by the... I think it's a 5-4 climb from, right. uh, from the uh, west side. Right, the west side, the gun sight notch to uh, the southern peak. That's not, each move is not difficult, and it does protect, but it's got, again, a lot of air, and then you've, you're getting into this little uh, kind of uh, rock foxhole and bring mm -hmm. your partner up, and then you continue on, but... It, it just throws people, I think. And the, the harder climbs have even more air. The climbs at the gunks don't seem to have it have as much. Although, I, I, maybe I just don't climb at the higher enough level to get caught in that much air at, at the gunks. It well, always seemed to me at the gunks you could break it down to little pieces easier and, and make the move. Mm -hmm. That was my take on it, but. Did you find New Hampshire grades easier than, than both of those? I haven't climbed uh, there other than scrambling uh, mm -hmm. trips. So you didn't do anything up in the whites? Or? No. I've, I've been up to the Dax. Uh, I've done the, uh, uh, the slabs on mm -hmm. uh, Chapel, Chapel Pond. Pond. Yep. They seemed easier than uh, the slabs we, we have around here at uh, Buzzard Rocks. Right, right. <laughs> I, well, I just don't do much slab climbing, so it's uh, not a natural thing. Right. Yeah. But uh, I, I found Chapel Pond was pretty straightforward, uh, or it seemed to be at the time, but maybe mm -hmm. it was more of my game than... Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I didn't do it when I was particularly young. Uh, it was in my uh, 40s when Dave Coffey and I went there. Well, and Buzzards has been only recently redeveloped. Yeah, uh, when I, that's an interesting transition because when I went there in the 70s, everything was for all practical purposes top rope because right. otherwise you would take a grounder. Right. But nowadays, I think who's ever developed it has done just the right amount of resident pieces. So okay. it's still a trad climbing area. And when it really gets dangerous, there's a bolt. But it's not over, over bolted, I, I would right. say that. And it, it's really, uh, I mean, two areas I've started climbing around here are Buzzard mm -hmm. and uh, Little Stony Man. And, you mm -hmm. know. An hour and a half drive, or an mm -hmm. hour, you've got slab and crack for a day trip. Right. Near an East Coast major city. Uh, they're, they're great resources, and, and the guys who developed uh, Buzzard in particular with the resident uh, pro there right. have, have just done, I think, the right balance to keep it as a trad climbing area. I mean, in some places you have to have serial bolts, otherwise it's right. no protection. Yeah, Buzzard used to be called Little L Cap. Yeah, um, it's, it was more of an, an, under, an undertaking years yeah. ago, yeah. Uh, yeah, I still find the walk a bit much. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Anything else you can think of? No. Andre? No. No? I presume you guys are going to edit this down oh, so it's yeah. more coherent. Yeah. Yeah, we'll try and make it look coherent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'll just, um, if we could have some room tone, so if everyone could be quiet sure. for 15 seconds. Sure. Okay, I think that'll work. Okay.